It's okay. It's good. All right. Hey, everybody. I will be drinking a lot of water while I'm lecturing today because <laughs> I had an eventful trip to the hospital yesterday. So, uh, anyways. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so today's lecture is going to be about. Um, well, this whole week has been about domain-specific programming systems, where if you want performance and you want to be able to write code pretty quickly, um, there are a lot of really new systems out there that are very useful. And, and Spark is one of the systems that probably got some of the most attention in the last five years. So this is something that a lot of people use in businesses and things like that. But before I start today's lecture, I want to talk about one other thing that I didn't have time to uh, last time. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about one way to think of uh, one domain specific programming system for graphs. Now you will not use this in your assignment, uh, but your, your assignment uh, is actually going to be about writing some parallel graph algorithms. So I'm going to just do 20 minutes on, on this just really quickly because it might be interesting. And I'm going to post the rest of the lecture online. It's just optional and you might find it interesting. Okay. Okay. So last time, the idea was that in the same way that 15 years ago, people were like, programmers do not want to write parallel code. And then everybody said, well, we have to. <laughs> and then for the longest time, people said, well, there's no way programmers are going to want to write code for different types of processors, different heterogeneous processors. And in the last couple of years, we've kind of said, well, you're going to have to. Um, and the reaction to make it easier has been, hey, it's possible to write code for these complex machines if the compiler gives you a lot more help. So the examples from last time were about the compiler choosing what algorithms to use, compiling your code differently to GPUs or clusters of CPUs. And today, or just for a few minutes here, I'd like to talk to, there are a bunch of systems out there to help you program algorithms on graphs. And people have become very interested in algorithms on graphs because they want to do things like machine learning on social networks. Or they want to look at the connections between a bunch of users. <coughs> so there has been tons of interest in running really fast code on big graphs. So I think uh, in, a sign in your assignment, I gave you a graph that I think has 200, uh, has about 500 million edges. So big graphs. And, and you'll be able to process a 500 million edge graph in five seconds. Um, so, so you know, you take all the people in the world, it's only a, an 8 billion or a 5 billion node graph. And so we can process really big graphs these days if you do it correctly. So here's what I want you to think about just a little bit. So last time, we talked about two programming systems. We talked about one to do computing on meshes. And meshes are just graphs. And we also talked about one to do computing on images. Images are actually just regular graphs in some sense. So if you were to, how many people have, what graph algorithms have you learned in your previous classes? Yeah. Which ones? I'm curious what graph algorithms you have been taught in previous classes. Well, you say it in Chinese. Okay. <laughs> Somebody will know. Okay. PageRank. You've done PageRank? Okay, very good. So you have done PageRank. That's good. Okay. On ray tracing. Uh, on a graph. Well, it will, that would be a scene graph. <laughs> That's more of a tree. You would do ray tracing on trees. Um, so you've done page rank. Have you done uh, things like breadth first search? Depth first search? Okay, great. So everybody's had some algorithms on graphs. And you'll do page rank and you'll do breadth first search in your assignment. So that's good that you don't have to learn the algorithms as part of the assignment. But otherwise, they're not too hard to learn either. Okay, so whenever I'm trying to design, so actually most of my research is actually on the design of some of these domain-specific systems. So like if you look at Yang's research, he's designing domain-specific systems for rendering. Um, and the way to think about it is, well, if I have a problem, what part of the problem does the programmer have to do? And what part of the problem 
does the system give the programmer for free? What does it help you with? So let's see if we can figure this out for the two, two systems we talked about last time. So last time, do you remember, what was the programmer's responsibility? If I was a programmer writing in list, what am I responsible for doing? What do I have to tell the, the, the compiler? So I'll start to give you a hint. The first thing I need to do is I need to tell the compiler, here's the graph of the mesh that I'm running. I'm going to run my computation on this mesh. Now, what else did I write down in code? Do you remember? What's one thing that I wrote down in code last time? Well, I'll give you one more. One, one thing I had to do was I had to tell the system, here are the values that need to be stored on the, on the mesh. Here's what values I want per vertex. Here's what values I want per face, per edge, and things like that. And then the last thing I had to do was what? is I actually had to write my simulation out of I actually had to tell the compiler, hey, here, here's the algorithm on how we're going to compute temperature from these other values. So here's how we're going to compute position or velocity from these other values. Now, the question that I would ask myself is, well, OK, if I do all that, what does list do for me? Why would I want to write in list and not write in C++? So it, what did you like from last time? Any, uh, any thoughts? Like if we had to do, the, if we wrote the code that we talked about last time in C++, I wouldn't have gotten nearly as much help. So what did list do for me? So let's start. So, well first of all, list figured out how to paralyze my program. I didn't tell it how to, pro to I didn't tell it how to paralyze. It figured out how to paralyze my program. And on a cluster, list said, well, since I know all the dependencies, I know how to split up your mesh into a bunch of different pieces for all the different nodes of the cluster. On the GPU, it was able to figure out that, oh, a graph coloring algorithm was a good way to figure to paralyze the program without using any locks. That's what list did for me. And I would not expect my C++ compiler to ever do those kinds of uh, sophisticated things. Now what about Halide? So with Halide, what I was responsible for doing was saying, here's the algorithm. Here's how you compute the value of every output pixel as an expression of all the input pixels. That's what I do if I'm a programmer of Halide. But we went through this process of, remember you figured out, you helped me figure out exactly how to order the loops and how to, uh, to block, to use to use intermediate buffers and, and do all these complex things to make it run fast. We probably spent 25 minutes in class talking about how to make a very simple program run fast. But in Halide, you just tell Halide really high level things. You say, paralyze this loop or block this loop. And then Halide will help you by generating all the low level code that actually does that. So you don't have to do it. So, if we're going to write some code for graphs, well, we need to think about what are the, the operations that algorithms that work on graphs need to do, and then figure out how to make it easy to write programs that run on those graphs. So in this lecture and in your homework, I'm going to represent graphs like this. I'm going to use arrays to represent graphs, so there's going to be no pointers. I'm going to have a bunch of vertices. So here's my graphs. And zero, you know, I have six vertices. And every this is a directed graph. So every uh, vertex has either outgoing or incoming edges. And so at every vertex, I'm going to store a list of the edges that are outgoing. And I'm going to store a list of the edges that are incoming. So my representation of a graph is an array. Or is it, is it several arrays? I'm not doing pointer structures or anything like that. Okay, so I'm glad that you guys have already seen PageRank. So let's talk about the PageRank algorithm very quickly. So for those of you that may not have seen it, PageRank is a very, you know, very famous algorithm for computing the importance of a node in a directed graph. And the computation that needs to happen, the goal is to compute the ranking of every node. 
and I'm going to call the ranking of node i, of vertex i, ri. And the ranking of ri is just basically the sum, the weighted sum, of all the rankings, of all the nodes that point to i. So if every node has a score, if I look at all the links to node i, I'm going to average, I'm going to do a weighted average of all the other nodes that point to i. So if I go back to this graph, for example, if we talk about node 4, well, there are, there's node 6 and node 3 are incoming edges to node 4. Well, page rank will compute the average, the sum of all of those, uh, of the, the score of 6, the score of 3, and average that to update 4. So in some sense, this is very similar to the graph of uh, the mesh algorithms we talked about last time. And this is sort of very, this is an ir irregular version of the uh, convolution we talked about last time, because before we, when we were blurring an image, we were just averaging all the neighbors as well. Okay, so because everybody was trying to do these analyses on very big graphs, and, and many of the, the, the researchers that wanted to work on graphs were not so good at parallel programming. So uh, folks, and this was actually done at Carnegie Mellon, um, said, why don't we make it a lot easier to develop a framework, a domain-specific system for writing these graph algorithms? And that's what this system called GraphLab is. And in GraphLab, you just write your code down, and it looks a lot like this. You just write down the math of your algorithm. And GraphLab will take responsibility for doing the things that we talked about last time, figuring out what can be run in parallel, how to run across a cluster of machines, and so on and so on. So let's describe GraphLab very quickly. Now notice, notice, big red text, that whenever I start with a system, I've said this before, I always start describing it to you in terms of what are the things. So in GraphLab, the things are we have a graph, a graph has vertexes and edges, and the program gets to define, just like a list, what pieces of data are stored per vertex and what pieces of data are stored per edge. Um, and then like most programs, there's probably some read-only global variables, which can be called. Like an example of a read-only global variable might be the, uh, the coefficient alpha in page rank. has nothing to do with the graph, but my program has to access that value. All right, so in GraphLab, you write a program, and they call it a vertex program, not a vertex program in computer graphics. And a program, a vertex program, defines how to compute the value of data at some vertex in terms of the values of data at the na neighboring vertexes and the neighboring edges. That's the goal of a vertex program. And notice that a program that computes the value of the red node, given the edges for the blue nodes, looks a lot like the natural expression of the page rank algorithm. Every node is updated as a combination of its neighbors. So here's the basics of a, uh, of a graph lab program. And so I wrote the mathematics of what I'm trying to do at the top. And I wrote pseudocode for the graph lab program. This isn't exactly a graph lab. Um, down here. So the programming model says, this is my program that runs on vertex i. And for every, and then again, just like list, graph lab provides these operators of how to access nearby places in the graph. So this says, for every vertex j in my neighbor list, in the neighbors of vertex i, just like that summation up there, my sum, I need to add in the rank of vertex j, and I need to normalize by the number of outgoing neighbors. That's just the page rank value. So this code right there looks awfully like that. And then the final vertex i's rank is exactly 1 minus alpha over number of graph vertices plus the sum. So my code looks awfully like uh, uh, what the mathematics of the algorithm looks like. So in order to parallelize this computation, GraphLab is going to need to know what the dependencies are and what the parallel work is going to be. And so 
this vertex program, well, first of all, the vertex program is going to execute for every vertex. Even though I didn't put any for loops on the screen here, this is, a, this is a function that needs to be executed for every vertex in the graph. And the vertex program defines what adjacent edges are inputs to the program. So let's notice that uh, this program says that I need access to all of my neighboring vertices. In this case, it doesn't need access to any neighboring edges because PageRank doesn't put information on edges. It defines what computation to perform per edge or per neighboring vertex, how to update the vertex's value, and then, of course, and then it has an additional functionality of when I do this computation, maybe I want to update the neighbors as well. So here is a full graphics, uh, graph lab program in C++. So even though I call graph lab, a domain-specific language, it is actually implemented just as a C++ library. So when I use the term language, I don't actually mean programming language, I actually just mean set of operators. So this is valid compilable C++ code, and there's a lot of, a lot of text on the slide because C++ is kind of verbose, but the, the actual program is actually quite simple. So this is a function, uh, sorry, this is a class, and it's just of type so it's my page rank program, it's a, it's a vertex program. And let's see what this class defines. So first of all, it says, what are all the edges that this vertex program needs to access? So the function gather edges returns the edges that uh, GraphLab needs to access when you run this program on a vertex. And so in this case, it says, well, I need access to all of my edges because GraphLab needs to loop over all of the vertices around the current vertex. Okay. And then there's another function called gather. And gather function serves to bring in all the data, to access all the data from the, edge, from the, the surrounding vertices. So this thing says, so, so the gather function is going to be called once for every edge that this vertex program needs. So this program says, Graph Lab asks your code, okay, what edges do you need? Your code says, I need all of the incoming edges. And then Graph Lab will call your gather function for every one of the edges. And this is the current vertex, and this is the edge. So the gather function returns edge.source.data. So edge.source is just the vertex on the other side. So this says, give me the page rank of the vertex on the other side of the edge and then normalize it by the number of outgoing edges from that node. So that's just, that code right there says, just return. So every call to the gather function computes this. And PageRank will call the gather function number of edges times. Okay. And then once it's done calling that for all of your edges, GraphLab will call the apply function on your program. And the apply function will say, um, my vertex data, my new page rank, equals the new value, which is total plus the discount. So total is just the value that's passed in here, and that's the sum of all the gather functions. So, all you do as a programmer is you say, I'm going to write a function that corresponds to what goes in the summation. GraphLab will call that function for all the edges and do the summation. And then I will define one function which computes how to, how to compute r sub i, and that is called apply. And then some graph algorithms need the ability to update neighboring edges, but GraphLab does not. So the scatter function is not a, is a, is a no-op here. There's no scatter function. And in GraphLab, so all you do is you define that code, and then you go up here and you say, um, engine is just GraphLab. You just say engine.signalall and run. So signal all just says, I want to run the, graphics pro, uh, the, the vertex program that I just wrote on all of the vertices in the graph. So you can interpret this as basically saying, put all the vertices in the graph in a work queue, 
And for each item in the work queue, run the vertex program. And running the vertex program means it will call gather edges. It will then call gather on all of the edges. And then it will uh, do the summation for you and then call apply. So this is like the, the, the this is how I would implement graph lab, page rank in graph lab. And then the runtime can parallelize this over a bunch of computers, it can parallelize it over a big single parallel computer, because all the dependencies and all the data access are done by graph lab, not by my code. My code is just regular C. Now there are a few additional details, like um, this implementation of page rank is actually not a very fast one. So some parts of the graph may converge more quickly than others. So if you implement a high quality version of page rank, um, what may often happen is, uh, is some parts of the graph don't need to be run for as many iterations as other parts of the graph. So um, what I did here is, so I still have the same graph lab program, and I changed the per vertex data. I used to only have page rank and maybe the name of the web page. And now I added an extra piece of per vertex data called counter. And if I want to run 10 iterations of page rank, in my apply function, so this goes back to the apply function is right here. This is how I update the vertex. When I update the vertex, my new code says uh, vertex.signal. So this is add this vertex back into the work queue. In, uh, yeah. Increase the counter and add it back into the work queue as long as the counter has not reached 10. So this is the way I can do iteration in Graph Lab. So now every vertex updates itself and then puts itself back in the Graph Lab work queue and does that 10 different times. So now I've written an algorithm that does one round of page rank, two rounds, all the way up to 10. So you signal, you can just read it as, add this vertex to the global work queue of work. And it, since I have the ability to, so, so the, the ability to signal is a very general primitive. And so now all I did is I said, look at this. So it's this exact same program all the time. When I apply, the only thing I'm doing now is I'm saying, what was the old value of the vertex? What is the new value of the vertex? And if the old value minus the new value is above some threshold, if the value of this page's rank is changing a lot, then we should probably update, we need to actually update our neighbors. Because my page rank has changed, therefore I'm going to influence nearby vertices. And so this is the first example of using scatter. Notice that uh, scatter is now saying for every edge next to me, if I have not converged, go ahead and tell them to run again. So the way this code is now running is it's performing the page rank update. It's computing whether or not the page at rank update has converged. And if it hasn't converged, I'm going to schedule all my neighbors and myself to continue to update until convergence is happening. So that's about it on GraphLab, <laughs> is you write a code for how to update a vertex. You write code that specifies what input edges you read data from, what output edges you write data from, and you have the ability to tell GraphLab when to run your vertex program. And that's about it. And the system handles the rest for you. So when you're working on assignment three, uh, which Jan will give you after class, um, you can think about, man, I wish it was much easier to do something like what I'm writing right now in C++. And there are a bunch of frameworks out there that actually do make it quite easier. And I imagine in your own algorithms research in the future, you might need the ability to process very big graphs. And so these are some things you might want to look at to help you do that. Okay, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about smart. Okay, 
So, let's see if you know this. Now, now I'm going to get you talking again. I put this slide up in an earlier lecture. In fact, I also put this slide up on one of your homework assignments. So, this is an example of a program where I made a library of array addition and array, array multiplication schemes, uh, uh, functions. So this add adds to arrays, multiply multiplies to arrays. And then I wrote a program which performs this complex expression on arrays in terms of adds and multiplies. Then I wrote another program here, um, which does it all in one function call. Now, with you and your friend, because you've done this on your homework, really quickly, I want to know which code is faster. And why? Why is, why is the code faster? piece of code is faster? First piece of code or second piece of code? Second, second piece of code. Correct. Now why do you think the second piece of code is faster on any modern computer? You're absolutely correct. Less memory access. Because here, every one of these pieces of code reads data, does one math, writes the array. And then reads the array again, does one math, writes the array. Here, I reorganize the computation to read the data, do as much math as I can, and then write the array. And we know from, home, from assignment one that this will probably be bandwidth bound. And by changing the uh, ratio of memory accesses to loads and stores, we're able to make it go faster. So we can get higher utilization out of our processor. Exactly. Okay. So one term you might hear me use in this lecture, and I apologize if I use it too much, is what I did here is I took all three of these, uh, these function calls, and I, and I fused them, or I combined them into one. So if I had to draw the order of computation, if I said that this was array element 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, n, and I made another matrix where so this was add mole add like this. The original program is doing the work in this order, right? And the change program. is doing the work in this order, right? Okay, so keep that in mind. Now let's go to la yesterday's lecture. In yesterday's lecture, we spent a lot of time talking about the differences between these various programs. Where the first program computed the entire temp buffer, and then computed the entire output image. So if I had to draw this, it would be Two. And when I fixed it in program two, 
what I decided to do was uh, I was going to pick. I was going to do a couple of pixels. I kind of did the same thing, right? I basically was going down and down and down. So in all of these cases, the reason why we're going down is because the first item and zero is processed. It's sitting in cache, and then we want to reuse it right then and there. So when you make something, it's in your cache. So if you can use it immediately, that avoids loading the data again. Common optimization, we saw it uh, in my math library. We saw it in image processing. And so now, um, yeah, so all of these examples were changing the order of the loops to minimize data loads, or to improve what I call the arithmetic intensity, the ratio of math to actual loads. To actual loads. Okay. So now, the reason why I wanted to begin with this is I want to describe a completely different problem. So this problem, this is actually, I pulled this off the course website, see, July 19, 2017. These are the web logs from the, from the course website. So yes, I know every page that you have looked at, so I know the study. Uh, but I don't actually. Um, so let's take a look at the log. It says, OK, so this IP address on this date, can you read this? Is OK to read? You can probably see it on your laptop. Um, they access this particular URL. And then right here is sort of the, uh, the user agent. And user agent in web, uh, web programming means what browser was being used to view the web page. Um, it's kind of interesting, look at this, it's actually, uh, this is Bing search scraping the website. <laughs> this is Bing search, uh, fine. But you can see some places, let's see where, it's hard to read. So somebody was looking at the web page from Windows NT. Somebody was looking at the assignment write-up for us from Linux, and so on and so on. Okay, so so this is a, so, so this is like a web log. If you run Apache or any web server, you can just open up your web logs and look what's going on. Okay, so I'm going to start making some claims. So my claim is that you're all in this class because parallel programming is getting more popular. Celebrities like parallel programming. If I knew Chinese pop artists, I would have used them, but I don't. <laughs> I almost asked. <laughs> right? So, so there's, there's all these different bands that are going to be very interested in taking this course. Right? So my Taylor Swift's interested, Beyonce's, and a lot of these people are very interested in taking the course because they know that you have this spe these special uh, knowledge now and they want to get that too. Okay? So, if, let's say, if, if Taylor Swift tweeted, hey, this is a really interesting course, you know, our web logs would get very, very large. <laughs> they would get very, very large. Now, um, so, so they would they'd get really, really large. So imagine this web log has, like, it's like a terabyte of web log. And it's actually pretty easy to get a terabyte of, of text on a big plus thing. So I'm going to call this text file weblog.txt. And let's say that I, um, I have a cluster. And I want to start analyzing this huge web log because I want to know who's visiting my web page. And so I have a cluster, and for the sake of this lecture, um, yeah, uh, or we can even say it's a four terabyte. Let's say it's a four terabyte file. So I have a cluster, and let's just say that every computer in the cluster has a one terabyte disk. Fairly normal these days, one terabyte. And I'm going to store the file, split it across these four computers. And if you have a network file system like NFS, or you have a, a large uh, a distributed file system like HDFS, that's exactly how your files will be stored. If you, if you run an HDFS as your file system, and let's say I create a very big file, it will split the file up into some blocks, and it will store the file in a bunch of blocks across the servers. So assume that this is a network file system, so that any computer can access the file, and that may mean communication from node 0 to node 1 or something like that. So just assume it's a shared file system. 
So let's say that someone wants to analyze my weblogs. Like, let's say, well, we really want to know what phones all these fans of Taylor Swift are using, because that's where we want to advertise. And so if these are the types of things, like if I give you a four terabyte text file, and I say, go write a program that analyzes it, well, that, that could be a little tricky for all of us. We don't have a four terabyte disk, and so on and so on. So let me give you a very simple programming model that might help you with that code. So you are responsible for writing two functions. I'm going to call one function the mapper, and I'm going to call the other function the reducer. So here are the rules. Here are the rules. So the mapper is I'm going to write some code, and the mapper is going to read every single line of the file, and it's going to call your function mapper for every line of the file. So I'm going to, if the file has a billion lines, I will call your function one billion times. And I will provide you this variable line, which is the line of the file. And what your code can do is that I'm going to give it a, a dictionary or a hash table. And you can add to that hash table. So your code, what, what, what you wrote here is you're going to take the line and you're going to parse out the user agent part. So you're going to go find the, the browser, like Mozilla, or sometimes there's Safari, or whatever. So you're going to parse the line to get out the, the, uh, the browser. And then what you're going to do is you, you're going to say, look, I'm going to add an entry to this dictionary, or to, to this map. It's really a map. It's not a dictionary. Um, where I'm going to say that this, this cell phone, or sorry, this, this type of browser, I'm going to add an entry to it. So there's count one. So that's what this code is doing right here. So it says, OK, so you parse the, the browser out. Let's say you wrote a function which like, detects whether or not it's a mobile device. And if it's a mobile device, you're going to add to this map, to this data structure, the name of that device, comma one. That's the code that you wrote. And I promise you I will call your function for every line of the file. Now you're also going to write this thing called reducer. And what I'm going to do, because I'm the system, is I'm going to take all of the entries that have the same key, all the same user agents, and I'm going to combine them together for you into a list. And I'm going to call your reducer for each, each unique key. So if there's sort of like Safari and uh, Firefox and what else is there? In Chrome. If those are the three uh, browsers, I'm going to call your reducer function three times. The first time it will have Safari, and it will have a list of all the items from the, from the first step that had Safari. And it, then it will be Chrome, and I'll call Chrome, and I'll give you a list of all the, the things you added that had Chrome. And so this code just says, for v in values, just compute the length of this list and return the result. So the first step parsed out all the mobile user agents. The system then grouped them by the type of the, uh, the user agent. And then the second step, your code again, computed how many uh, instances of each browser there were. And then we can run the code like this. Is you're going to call map reduce job. You're going to hand me your mapper function. You're going to hand me your reducer function. You're going to say, here's the text file. And you're going to say, here's the output. So do the rule, do, does what the system needs to do make sense? Yes? No? Oh, so everybody's OK? All right, good. So let's actually implement this. Let's try and implement this. So here's our computer. Four nodes. The files are uh, distributed across. Uh, sorry, the, the pieces of the file are distributed across the uh, uh, across the cluster. So we have four computers. We have a billion lines of the file divided into eight blocks. How are you going to parallelize the mapper part of this computer? So one answer would be 
to take all of the lines in the file, or all eight blocks, and put them in a work queue. And then I have my four computers just grab the next item in the work queue. Does that make sense? All right, I can, I can make a work queue of size eight, eight blocks. And I can say, I can, I can say whatever computer is free, take the next block of the file and run the mapper on it. And so if we happen to assign uh, computer three to process block zero, then computer three will read that data from computer one over the network, or from computer zero over the network. So does my solution work correctly? Would it paralyze the computation? Yes, it would. Now, can you think of a better parallelization scheme than what I have proposed? So what I proposed is, let's just put all of the blocks in a list. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. One big list. Just a list of eight things to do. And then four of you are just going to come and grab the first thing that you can get. Completely correct solution. Not in parallel. But is there a better idea? And notice that node 0 already has block 0 and 1. And node 1 already has block 2 and 3. So how would you probably parallelize this instead? So my assignment here is very dynamic. If you were to do a static assignment, how would you statically assign pieces of the file to computers to do the work? Does it make sense for node 3 to be working on this data? Doesn't make much sense, right? So the other solution, so, so one solution would be, well, yeah, we could just make a list of things to do, and whoever's free does the list thing. The other thing we could do is we could say, well, wait a minute. Everybody should just work on the pieces of the file that they own to avoid communication. And, and hopefully that workflow balances pretty well. Okay, so let's say that we run that reducer function on all the lines, uh, sorry, so we ran the mapper function on all the lines of the file. And let's say that in this big file out of all the visit people visiting my website, there are four unique browsers. There's Safari, there's Chrome, there's iWatch, and there was Google Glass. So four unique, unique uh, uh, browsers. So that means that we have to run the reducer function on each of these. Okay? That's, that's what the rules of the game are. And let's say that after running the first step, so remember, node zero process block zero and block one. And the result of that processing is that it added to this map, right? So here's all the, here's the list of all the Safari iOS stuff. Here's the list of all the Chrome stuff, and so on and so on. So these are the results after step one. Now I want to count up. So th this is just an array of all the times we saw Safari in a line of the file. This is an array of all the times we saw Chrome in a line of the file. So now we need to run the reducer function. And the reducer needs all of those lines. So we're going to run the reducer function on the four unique keys. And in order to do that, I have to get, um, I have to get the results over to whatever node is supposed to run these keys. So all the computers, so if node 0 is responsible for processing the uh, Safari keys, all of the processors need to send the data to node 0. Okay, let's take a five minute break. But just make sure you understand how this whole flow works. And the whole flow is right here on this slide.
is that the contract is I will implement map reduce job and you will implement mapper and reduce it. You're the application right now. I will implement this. And my rules are I have to run mapper for every line of the file. I have to call your mapper for every line of the file. And after we have all these different key value pairs, I have to run reducer on every unique key. So we're here at this point. Because right now we just decided to run the reducer on node 0 for Safari, and we're going to run the reducer for Chrome on node 1, and so on. So, OK, let's take a quick break. So just as a reminder of where we left off. We had a programming framework. That programming framework runs in the following way. You as the application writer provide me a mapping function. I guarantee you that I will run that on every line of the file. If I'm a smart systems programmer, I'm going to assign lines of the file that are stored on this node to this computer. I will assign lines to the file that are already stored on this computer to that. Now, in calling your function, your, call, your function will output key value pairs into a dictionary, or sorry, into a map. And let's just say that I'm storing off, and then when I'm done, I store the results back in the file system. So these are the values that uh, this node process, these are the values of this, this node process, these are the values of this node process. So in this case, Safari iOS will literally look like this. Safari iOS comma 1. Safari iOS comma 1. Because your code outputs that every single time it sees a Safari line. Now, your reducer needs to get run. And so what I will do, and then, and then there might be a uh, Chrome 1, Chrome 1, and so on, so on. I'm going to take every one of these things with the same key, the same first element, package them up together, and send them to whatever node is supposed to run your reducer. You can then count all those keys. And in the end, you'll have a result of, oh, Safari iOS, well, there's two things. Chrome, there's two things, and so on and so on. Now, and this can work on hundreds and hundreds of computers, and people do run these things on hundreds and hundreds of computers. So there's a lot of other special stuff in the system that I'm implementing for you that handles a lot of useful things. Like if one of the computers fails during the computation, I'll just send that work to another computer. So I'm going to do a whole bunch of fun stuff for you. Uh, but that's not going to be what we're going to talk about. What we're going to talk about is the big problem here. And the big problem is that the way this code works is I load a file from disk. I store the outputs of the mapper to disk. And then I load them back from disk and do the reducer. So if we go back and think to those first two problems from the previous lectures, we were trying to avoid going out to memory. And this is an algorithm, this is a system that goes out to disk in between every step. And so imagine writing PageRank in this system. We can write PageRank in this system. It's actually kind of interesting. The mapper will uh, it will be run for every uh, for every vertex, and then every vertex needs to contribute to edges. And so I'm going to write the destination vertex and the value in the mapper, and then I'm going to gather up all the updates to the same value, to the same destination node, and I'll do the reduce. So I can actually write page rank in this system. It's kind of interesting, right? So now I'm going to run this for every vertex, but instead of gathering, bringing all the data in, I'm going to say that this vertex contributes ranking to all of these outgoing edges. I'll put a note here which says, here's the outgoing vertex. 
and here's the amount that this edge is supposed to contribute. The system brings those all together, and for any one vertex, we'll add them all up. So this is an valid implementation of page rank. Now imagine that we did this iterative graph algorithm, and every single time we ran an iteration, we wrote all the graph values back to disk, and then loaded them back in from disk. That would be really, really slow. That would be really, really slow. And so to give you some, a little bit of history is the first thing that I told you is, does anybody know what I was actually describing? I was really describing Hadoop. Has anybody written any code in Hadoop? So I was really describing to you how Hadoop worked, which is this programming system that allowed you to write this code for analyzing data over hundreds of computers. And people are like, well, that's great. Hundreds of computers with no work at all. I'm going to start writing everything in this system. And so some people started writing graph algorithms and things like that. So on your assignment three, you're going to write graph algorithms on hundreds of millions of, say, uh, yeah, hundreds of millions of edges. And it will take one computer about 10 seconds. And people were saying, hey, MapReduce and Hadoop, these things scale to hundreds of computers. When I run on 100 computers, it's like 100 times faster. But the problem is, is that it was like 100 times faster than an hour. <laughs> and so the code that you write in assignment three will be probably hundreds of times faster than using an entire cluster to do that type of algorithm. So some other people came along and said, this is ridiculous that when you're doing iterative computation, when you're running over the graph, or you're running over a data set over and over again, that you'd actually write your intermediate results out to disk. That just is ridiculous. So let's design a system that works over a bunch of clusters and turns code that runs this way into code that runs this way. So this is a, a, also a very successful research project from Berkeley. And now it's called Apache Spark. You can just go onto apache.org and you can download this. And many companies use Spark to analyze their data today. So the goals were to make a programming system that could scale to clusters of machines. If a machine fails, it's OK. We'll, we'll redo the work on another computer. So have all of the, the nice things about cluster computing. But never write your intermediates to this. So there are a couple ways is if your computer fails, you lose all the memory, right? So the challenge was that every, if we wrote to disk after every step, if our computers failed, it was OK. Because we would just start from the last time that we wrote to disk. But so there are a lot of techniques if I'm, if I'm, if I'm writing to disk. But one thing I could do is I could have two computers do every computation I'm supposed to do. Because if one fails, it's OK. I'll just use the result from the other one. But that's not very efficient, because now I'm using twice as many computers to do the work thing. Um, I can always sort of, I can do checkpoints, I can write to disk from time to time, and then come back and, and redo the work if my computer fails. Um, or uh, if I'm a databases person, I can do things like maintain logs and then play back the logs, but I won't talk about that too much here. So Spark did something a little bit different. Spark says if you know all the dependencies and a computer fails, you can just go back and compute exactly what was needed because you know all the dependencies. So the main idea in Spark is, to, is this abstraction called RDD. So RDD stands for a Resilient Distributed Data Set. So first of all, let's think about RDD as an array. This is incorrect, but let's think about it like an array. So you could imagine, like if you were writing Python, if you said, load this text file, you would get back an array of type string. Right, I would get an array of a bunch of strings, all the lines in the text file. In fact, let me go ahead and change that. Uh, and then, this is actually Scala code, by the way, because most of Spark is written in Scala. So Scala is basically Java. This is, so I'm showing you Java code. So this says, OK, if this is an array of all the lines in the text file, Let's filter out the lines for which this function is true or not true. So here I wrote, just wrote a function which takes its input a string and calls the function, is, a, is it a mobile browser? Is it a mobile client? So if I give you the string, 
uh, Chrome desktop will return false. If I give you the, the string uh, Android Chrome, it will return true. So if I run that function on all the lines of the text file, I'm going to get a new array out, which contains only the lines that are mobile browsers. And then I did it again. I said, OK, well, what if I want only the Safari mobile lines in the text file? So I just wrote another predicate, which says, OK, does the string of the browser name contain the word Safari, which is Apple's browser? So now I have another array, which is only the lines in the file that are Safari mobile. And then I can do Safari views.count, and I can get the number of, of views from Safari. Pretty simple, right? Okay. So if these were arrays, and I, I, I should have wrote that, what I wrote here on the board is I, I wrote them in terms of, of ints, not strings, but you get the point. <laughs> is if I allocate an array, if I say in C++, variable A is a new array of type int, and let's say it's an array of length 1024, how much memory is allocated here? 4 bytes times 1024 elements. And there is memory used for every single one of these. It's perfectly fine to think about these as arrays when you're just learning what this program means. But now I need you to stop thinking about these as arrays. They are not arrays. They are RDDs. And if this was an array, I could go, you know, I could access A sub i. I can do that. That's what arrays allow me to do. It is not possible for me to access an arbitrary element of an RDD. So it's better to think about it as a collection. And there's some strong reasons why these are a limited collection. So um, what I'm drawing here on this right side, or on the right <coughs> side, is the dependency graph of if I have a text file, I can create the RDD lines from the text file. And if I run a filter, I can create the RDD mobile views. If I run another filter, I can create Safari views. And if I call count on Safari views, I get the integer, which is the size back. So I never access the contents of these RDDs, except when I ask for the, the size of the last RDD, or except when a single element from the RDD was passed to the filter. So here, this filter says x, and my filter says it will take one string or one line from the file and return a bool. And this will take one line from the file and return a bool. Now, even though I wrote this uh, as separate lines of code, um, now I'm just writing it a little bit more compactly. So this says, mark that text file that returns an RDD. Then I called filter on the RDD, and I got back a new RDD. And I called filter on that and got back a new RDD. That's what's going on here. And then I call an operation called reduce by key. And reduce by key will take all of the, uh, the elements with the same key and turn them into a list. So, so let me, let's see. So, so input was a text file. I get a, I get a bunch of lines. I get an RDD that contains strings. I filtered out some of the elements. I filtered out, uh, uh, so, so here it's for every input line in the file, I parsed out the browser, the user agent, and output a tuple, which was the browser comma one. And then I ran one of the very few operations you can do on an RDD, which says I want you to make a new RDD which takes all of the elements of the RDD that have the same value at the beginning of the tuple, and I want you to put them all together in a single element. So if this is a collection of type string, this is a collection of type string, this is a collection of type tuple string comma integer, and this is a collection of tuple string comma list of integer. Make sense? Just see the, the types of it. Okay. And then I called collect, which just says turn that RDD 
back into a regular array in Java. So I've only shown you three different operations on, uh, on RDBs, maybe four. I've showed you how to create one from a text file. I've shown you how to ask for its size. I've showed you how to filter one to create a new one. And I've given you this other one, which is reduced by key, which takes, a, takes all the tuples and makes, a, makes another RDD, which is a list of all the tuples with the same starting point. And on the right, the dependency graph in Spark is often called the lineage. Because what this means is if you want to compute this RDD, you have to go back and compute this one, which means you have to compute this one, and this one, and this one. So this is the dependencies. Let me just give you one more example just to help. Here's uh, another one, and I just want to make sure you it's clear that the dependency graph need not be a single pipeline. It can branch out. So again, we loaded the file, we filtered out the lines, and then we did two different filters. So one is we filtered out by Chrome browser, the other one we filtered out by Safari browser. Uh, for all the Safaris, we just counted how many there were. For all the Chromes, uh, we parsed the file a little bit more. So this is also a valid program. So Spark gives me two things. It gives me the ability to create RDDs, and it gives me to create the ability to create new RDDs using any one of these stream or these RDD operators. So, uh, so the RDD, the, the operator map says if I have one RDD of type T and I have a function that takes a type T to a type U, if I map that function onto all the elements of the RDD, I get a new RDD of type U. Filter is another example I showed you, which takes an RDD of type T to an RDD of type T. It just removes some of the elements. And you can kind of look through all of these, and these are things that you might expect a computer system to have. Uh, sample takes some fraction, you know, re removes some of the elements from the RDD. Uh, reduce by key, we talked about. Uh, join, let's look at this one. So join takes an RDD of keys and values, and another RDD of keys and values, and makes a new RDD, RDD where the W and Bs have been stuck together as long as they have the same key, it's like a database join. So Spark is about RDDs and operators on RDDs. Notice that there's no um, operator to say, give me the fifth element of the RDD. There's no direct array access like this. OK. So now let's go back to our four node cluster and think about how are we going to actually implement Spark. So, Here's a very, you know, here's that simple Spark program that will read a file from disk to create an RDD, maps a function onto all the elements which converts them all to lowercase, filters out browsers that aren't mobile, and then counts the results. So I'm asking the question, how many mobile browsers are there visiting my web page? So if these were arrays, and I wrote the code kind of like this. Well, what would happen is that I'd have to allocate, so if my, if my file was eight different blocks, well, then I'd have to allocate in memory storage for all of the different RDDs. So this is the, this is the storage on disk for uh, uh, a piece of the file. Well, here's just the, uh, the in-memory version, the RDD, and then here's the allocation for the lowercase version. So if this was a four terabyte file, my program would need one, two, three, you would need 12 terabytes of memory to run this program. So if we think about RDDs like arrays, my program needs 12 terabytes of, 12 terabytes of memory. That's trouble, <laughs> right? Or I can think about them as files. If I think about the RDDs on files, I would actually allocate 12 terabytes on disk, and I would end up saving every RDD to disk and loading it back in every time. So what I have on the screen right now 
was very much like going this way. Right, I, want to alloc I want to create every element of an intermediate RDD, and then I'm going to use every element of an intermediate RDD, and so on and so forth. So that's not how we're going to do things. So let's look at the dependencies for this program. I'm keeping the program up here. So these are the blocks on the of the file. And if those are the blocks of the file, well, there's different parts of the other RDDs that depend on the blocks of the file. So there's like one part of lines that depends on block zero of the file. But well, there's another part of lines that depends on block one of the file. And this block depends on this, and so on and so on. OK with this diagram? Like, these lines, this part of the RDD lines, does not need this information from block zero, and so on and so on. Okay. Now, if I went back to this diagram, I think you'd agree with me to say that allocating all of this memory is unnecessary and stupid. So given what we talked about, about going vertical, how would you schedule this program if these were all the dependencies? that never has to allocate very much memory. So if this is a file on disk, and we know that to get this output, we need to compute this, and then this, and then read this off disk, would you read all that off disk and create all of these? And then go back and create all of these? And then create all of these? Or would you perhaps go this direction? Right? So now we can, we can just read a thousand elements off disk. We can create a thousand elements in memory. We can create a thousand lowercase elements in memory. We can filter out by what's needed. We can maybe get 670 elements that we can, and, that we're done, and then we're done. And then we can go back up here and load another thousand elements off, off of disk. Do this processing, do this processing, do this processing. And the size of what we are allocating to memory is completely small. In fact, I could actually just load one line off of disk of the file, process it here, process it here, process it here. And so the amount of memory that I need would be only like a couple lines of the file at any one time. Right? So if I was to implement this efficiently, I would write exactly this code. I would say while input not into file, read one line of the file, make it lowercase. Check to see if it's mobile, and if it's not mobile, or if it is mobile, add to my count. So this code can run on a four terabyte file, and how much memory does it need? It needs like this string and this string. Two lines in the file are all that I need to, to stay in four. And so that's exactly how Spark will implement, going back here, this program. Is it knows how to compute every element of the output in terms of all the elements of the input. And it's going to execute it in this vertical order. And it will only allocate the memory that's necessary to do so. So this is why I'm saying, even though you can think, at first you want to think about RDDs as arrays, an array is allocated in memory. An RDD is a collection that you know how to get the value of any element if you need to. But there's no guarantee that all the data of lower or mobile views or how many is actually ever present in memory at the same time. Like this program only needs to know what the size of memory of how many is. So it just loads. It'll run very much like this. And so the implementation of Spark is actually pretty simple. Is that the, the Spark runtime just implements all these various RDD operators. And it does so in a vertical or streaming fashion. So let's look at the simplest one. Where is, where is uh, text file? So this is a function that returns an RDD from a text file. So if I say text file, it returns an RDD. And if I map onto the, uh, to the text file, if I call next, if I want to get the next element in this RDD, 
Well, I just read the next line of the plot. So imagine I had an RDG that looked like this. Let's say I had a program that looked like RDG RDG1 equals read from text file. I have RDG2 equals RDBX and then RDBY equals X dot map some function that, let's just say it's uh, two lowercase. So X is an RDB that's all the lines in the text file. And why is an RDD that's all the lines in the text file after they've gone through this function? Okay. So just let's think through how this will execute. So the first line of code returns an RDD that is the text file. Oh, and then let's just say that I want to uh, uh, for a reason. So let's just say I want to know how many elements are in Y. So if I, count, if, I, uh, if I call count, it'll say while this RDD has no more elements, get the next element and add plus plus. So where's next? So next on an RDD that came from a map, says, well, get the next element of the RDD that I depend on, and then apply the map function to it. And the, I, the RDD that I depend on, parent.next, would be RDD from text file.next, which just reads the line from the text file. So, so now this one line from the text file is just streaming through the whole system, and then if RDD uh, from map calls next again, we read another text file, another item, and we run that through the function, and so on and so on. So this code will run very much like uh, this code right here. It runs in exactly the same order. Okay, so this really, really efficient way to execute this code works whenever the elements of this RDD depend only on, like, one element here depends on one element here, depends on one element here, depends on one element here. And since the lines are straight up, um, these are called narrow dependencies. So this element, to get this element, you only need to compute one element, you only need to compute one element, you only need to load one line for the file. But not all the operations in the world are narrow. So, Let's look at the operation that we talked about from Hadoop, which is called group by key. So remember what group by key does is, is if it has, if group by key has like A1, B2, A4, A5, B3, B2. These are the elements in our RDD. Group by key is going to make a new RDD, which is just A, 1, 4, 5, and B, 2, 3, 2. That's the definition of group by key. Let's take all the elements, figure out what keys are shared, and then put everything with the same key into a list. So group by key is one of the RDD operations. I can say, load this text file, process it to create key value pairs, and then group by key. Now notice that group by key, what does this mean now? This means that every single element and the output RDD depends all over the place on the other RDDs. 
And in fact, you don't know what its dependencies are until you actually have all the data. So group by key in this case, you know, this particular output element might be a bunch of input elements. So I cannot use this very efficient streaming way of writing the code, right? I have to actually produce all the output elements. And then I need to group them. So the operators that, you, they, that are used will change the efficiency of your program a whole lot. Like if you want to do a group by key, we have to compute all the elements first in order to group them. You know, here's, a, here's another example of, uh, of a join operation. And a join operation is something that you would have seen in databases where if I have, uh, uh, well, join is, is almost like a group by key. It's whenever you have a, uh, a tuple, so I have, let's say, a name followed by a number. And over here, I have a name followed by a string. So I have two RDDs. My first RDD, A. A is string, string, and my second RDD B, string, int. So my first RDD A has, oh, shoot, other way around. RDD A is a type string comma int. RDDB is a type string comma string. And if I join them, that's like a database join. So it's, it's I want to take elements from both the RDDs with the same key and I want to stick them together. So the output will be of type uh, string comma So if you look down here, it's like, so if kbon is comma 1, and over here in RDDB, kbon is comma fits, then the output of the join would be kbon tuple 1 fits. Now notice that in RDDA, I've partitioned the names across the cluster in a different way than I did in RDDB. So kbon is on node 0 here. Uh, for RDDA, Kmon is on node, where am I? Oh, I'm also on node 0 for RDDB, but uh, let's say Alex is on node 0 for RDDB, but Alex is on node one, uh, through 2 here for RDDA. So in order to bring them together, to join them, data has to move across all the nodes. So this is an example of if I just resorted, repartitioned the RDD so that Kvon always showed up on node zero, and uh, Randy and my old TA Robbie always showed up on node one, I could perform this join only with narrow dependencies and no communication across nodes. Whereas the same join needs communication across nodes because the, the arrays were partitioned differently. And so Spark has a few examples of how you can, you can uh, explicitly set how you want to partition your RDDs across the cluster so that you can eliminate, uh, you can try whenever possible to make sure that your, uh, your joins are narrow, your dependencies are narrow. Okay, so um, yeah, so, so you're going to write these, these Spark computations. And what I'm showing you here is I'm just showing you a dependency graph. And what I'm showing here in red are RDDs that have to that cannot be narrow, or I cannot do the vertical thing. So the red RDDs are, are RDDs that will actually all exist in memory or on disk at one time. So this one will exist on disk because let's just say it's it's the disk, it's the file. Oh, right. Well, no, this, this is on this because, because of the group by key. But we can use this group by, uh, and then this is a map, so these don't have to stay on, on 
in memory at the same time. I can just compute this directly from this. Um, then I can compute this directly and pair it up here. And so the different operators you use will force the runtime to either keep everything in memory or be able to stream it through the system all at once. Uh, and an interesting exercise to, to try and do is to try and uh, understand why these values all need to be in memory and these values need to all be in memory. So these values all need to be in memory because there's a group by key. And the group by key means that we don't know what elements all have the same key until we produce all of the elements. So, okay, so, so one, re one nice thing about RDDs is that Spark can take a program that you write that's horizontal and implement it very efficiently Another nice thing about RDDs is that since Spark knows how to compute every element of an RDD in terms of the input elements, if a computer ever fails, we can just go back and redo the computation. So imagine that we're sitting here like uh, running this program. So it's divided across disks like this and we're working on this part, and we're working on this part, and so on and so on. And this computer crashes. This computer completely crashes. Uh, its disk is still there, but the, the processing crashes. Well, all we need to do is just give that work to the other computers that survive. So we lost, in the crash, we lost partition 2 and partition 3 of timestamp. So we can just go ask computers 0 and 2 to go compute those partitions. And to compute those partitions, we know that timestamps part 2 needs mobile views part 1, and mobile views part 1 needs web block, or no, needs timestamps part 2, and timestamps part 2 needs mobile views part 2, and mobile views part 2 needs file block part 2. And so the, uh, uh, the computation can just get redone as necessary whenever a node is detected to have crashed. So those are two things that Spark gives you. It gives you in-memory fusion of all these RDDs, and it gives you resilience if you ever lose a computer, because maybe you're running on hundreds of them. If one crashes, the other 99 will just pick up the work that that computer was supposed to do, and your computation just finishes. So here are some initial results from, from Spark, where they used two different machine learning computations. One was clustering, or really not no machine learning, but uh, data analytics. One was k-means clustering, competing clusters in some data. And the other was a logistic regression. And so Hadoop was, it's like MapReduce, it's the, it's the system that we started talking this lecture about. And Spark is the system here on the right. And there are a couple of really interesting things to think about um, in doing this. So first of all, uh, the Hadoop program spends about 80 seconds per iteration on uh, logistic regression. And it spends about 120 seconds, about 100 seconds per iteration in k-means clustering. That's just like reading the data off of disk. Because <laughs> you spend 100 seconds on it. And Spark, for all iterations after the first one, is reading it out of memory. So that 80 or 46 seconds drops all the way down to 3. That's the difference between in-memory and disk. 46 to 3. So the Spark people were very happy with themselves. They said, like, wow, this is completely disk bandwidth bound. And now it is only taking 3 seconds per iteration. You know, that's a speed up over my uh, old code by you know, almost a factor of 20 or 30. So everyone's like, wow, this is really amazing. But for those of us that are interested in high-performance computing, this is why when you read papers, you need to read them a little bit more closely. <laughs> so what was kind of interesting to me was that this baseline algorithm written in Hadoop, which let's just say, let's just take this one in k-means clustering. 
it would take all the points, parse the text file into numbers, and then write the result to disk. And I do so over and over and over again for every iteration of k-means. And but every iteration of k-means takes like 106 seconds. So that means they were parsing the text file every single iteration of k-means, which is not something that, that you would ever do, right? You would actually store the binary file and just read the numbers. So there were a lot of things that, that the, this community, we were all focused on using tons and tons of computers. And we weren't actually very focused on raw performance. So last year, no, not last year now, it's 2015, um, some folks at Google wrote this paper saying, hey, everybody is doing really, really stupid stuff. And so let me explain this graph to you. Is they took some of these systems, like some of those that I'm telling you about, like GraphLab and Spark and some of these other domain-specific systems that are supposed to help you run on hundreds of machines in the cloud. And they measured how fast they could process various graphs. So these are all graph processing frameworks. So these are pretty expensive, right? Like this is, a, it takes 128 cores across a small cluster, you know, and it runs in 400 seconds. Or in this example, 462 seconds. But, you know, these are impressive demos because they run on 128 cores. Um, here's another example with the, the Twitter graph. This is the size of the Twitter graph. So there's you know, about 3 billion, 3 billion edges can be processed in 419 seconds. And then what these people wrote is they just opened up the C compiler and just wrote a really high quality implementation of graph processing. Basically what you will do in assignment three. <laughs> they just wrote nice C code, laid out the data nicely in memory, good programming practices. And one core of one computer was 275 seconds. But this was like linear scaling. This was like 100 times faster than the one core implementation in GraphX or GraphLab. So this is, this is pretty bad. And they continued to tune their code. And they got their runtime from 275 seconds all the way down to 110 seconds. So someone wrote a paper that just said, well-written C code on one core is four times faster than 128 cores in these frameworks that are very exciting because they scale to 128 cores. And so they wrote this paper, which is very interesting, which says the public work, work on big data systems, like some work in Spark and some of the other things, um, fetishizes or emphasizes scalability, like running on hundreds or thousands of cores is the most important feature of a system, when nearly all publications are always talking about their scalability graphs and not the amount of time it actually takes to run these various graph operations. And they're like, it's unclear to what extent using many computers is actually helping performance um, or just simply paralyzing the overheads that using some of these slower frameworks introduce just by using them. And so there's just a bunch of results in various types of machine learning where you know, one core or one GPU is running in six seconds. If you use the ideas from, for example, this class, and these expensive frameworks running on big clusters are significantly, uh, significantly more expensive. Um, and so this was a, a somewhat, people laughed a little bit, but it's a little embarrassing too, that this is true. So, um, so now you can, one thing that is true is that the, the people that are working on Spark are actually trying to do a lot to make sure that single core performance in Spark is getting a lot better. Uh, and so I think you'll see systems like Spark uh, starting to move significantly more, more, more rapidly uh, as time goes on. There's a lot of projects to try and do ISPC-like things from Spark. So, so anyway, so Spark is this system that's used by a lot of companies. Um, it's an embodiment of a lot of the ideas we've talked about before in this class, but they do it over clusters of computers. And I suspect at some point in your career you will probably use Spark, because there's all these popular systems out there for using Spark to do data analytics. Um, and so hopefully this lecture is, might be helpful to you if you ever have to pick one of those up. So, uh, yeah, so that, that's Spark. Um, Spark was done at Berkeley, 
and uh, the, the student that did it is now a professor at Stanford. So, and uh, several, you know, many companies are now developing these systems as well. So hopefully this week I was showing you a bunch of, of systems that are a lot easier to use, help you with parallelism. And it's a good example of research being done uh, at the universities. And within five or six years, the research that's being done is being used by a whole bunch of companies, some of the biggest companies in the world. So that is evidence of how important some of this stuff is. Um, so I think we have like 30 seconds. So if you have any questions, I can answer any questions. Or, uh, I encourage you to download Spark and play around. <laughs>